All right, so there are a lot of different topics contained within the, um, especially the apply the concept section of this chapter, and a lot of them didn't feel like they merited their own video. But uh, what I wanted to do is speed run through some of the more important topics within there to essentially say, hey, if you want to know more about some of this stuff, especially if it comes up in the um, programming assignment or anything like that, uh, this is all located in the apply the concepts section. So what you really should do is read through that and practice through everything as always. But I really want to make sure that there's at least a um, very brief description of some of those uh, pieces that maybe are a little more important from all of that. So while the focus on this chapter is repetition structures, I want to at least give you that maybe almost glossary of some of what's covered in the um, apply the concept section of chapter five. So let's get into it. Here are some things that I am somewhat broadly covering. Uh, I don't really get into details of a lot of that kind of stuff. It's a very top level view. So if you want to know more about some of this stuff, um, these are the places where you want to look. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the list box, which uses the ID LST, sort of like how a text box uses the ID TXT. It's going to display a list of items, um, sort of similar to like if a label had a list of things that the user actually could select. So a list box is actually interactable whereas a um, label wouldn't actually be interactable. But this displays a list of items, a list of like things. It could be words, it could be um, sentences, phrases, uh, numbers, all that kind of stuff, but they are all just strings and they're given in a list. Uh, the user can select these things uh, based on the behavior of the list box. By default, uh, the user is just going to select, be able to select one item. If they try to select another one, it will just switch to the latest one that they uh, selected and deselect the one that was previously selected. However, you can set your, them so that they the user can only do zero items or greater than or equal to one item, but we're not worrying about that so much in this chapter. Uh, However, the uh, number of things that the user can select is determined by the selection mode property. The GUI standards say that you should display at least three, but less than or equal to eight items at a time in your list boxes. Um, if you have less than three, there are probably other better ways of displaying it. Uh, if you have more than eight, that's going to be a lot. Uh, a scroll bar is going to display if there are more items than the size of the list box allows. So maybe your list box is kind of small and all of the, you know, preferably no more than eight items that you have in there can't actually fit on the screen at once. It gives you a, a scroll bar so that the user can scroll through your items and select everything. Uh, you also want to use a label control to provide an access key and tab access for that list box, as well as to let your user know what's going on. Similar to how you would use a label control for a text box or something like that. The labels tab index should be one less than the list boxes tab index. Here's an example of a um, application that uses a list box. Specifically, this rate percent right here is a list box of all of the um, percentage rates for this uh, monthly payment application. So. You have all of these different items. Um, you can select the different rates like 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, and so on and so forth. And you have your scroll wheel. So you can scroll down and see all of the options that don't fit into this relatively small space. Now there are some important list box properties and events that I do want to um, make sure you're aware of at least and you can get more information from the textbook. Uh, there's the dot items property, which is a collection of strings. More on that in a sec. Uh, the dot sorted property, which is a Boolean, uh, if it is true, then the list box will automatically sort all of the members in dictionary order. So, uh, you know, like an alphabetical A comes first, then B, then C, and, and so on and so forth. Also numerical, it goes up one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so when you sort it like that, it doesn't matter how m you um, add those items into your list box. Uh, it like what order you add them in, it will sort them in order. Uh, selected item is a string that contains the text of the item that is currently selected. And then the selected index is the index, you know, the position in the list of the item that is currently selected. Uh, it is an integer. It will start at zero for the first item in, item in the list, sort of like what tab index does. And then one will be the second, two will be the third, and so on and so forth. And then there are some important events as well. Uh, selected value changed. That event is going to trigger when the um, user selects a new value in the list box. Uh, same thing with selected index changed. Uh, if the index of the selected value changes, so the, the user um, selects a new value with like a new index or something, um, that's going to trigger that event as well. And you can use that in order to update uh, certain things. So if you want to update a value that you're using in a calculation or update a label that's uh, based on the selected value or anything like that, that's what those events are going to be really useful for. Sort of similar to how we use the um, click event to handle what happens when a button gets clicked. Now you can actually use the string collection editor to set what items are in the list. So every list box has an item collection, a collection being a, um, a group of individual objects, each object treated as one unit. So the collection here is the strings TN, KY, SD, and SC. Each of these are considered one item in the collection, and each of these has an index. Assuming this isn't sorted, TN will be uh, index zero, KY will have index one in the collection, and so on and so forth. SC has index three. Now the string collection editor is the window that you can use to very easily enter the strings in the collection. Um, and you get there by uh, going to, you know, in, in the, um, the actual editor for your application, you click on your list box and then you click items in the property win in the properties window. Uh, you can actually click the ellipses button in that items uh, property in order to pull up this uh, string collection editor. And then you just enter one item in the list at a time. Now it's important to do one per line because if you separated these by a space and did multiple in one line, it would assume that you're trying to refer to one item that was T N K Y S D S C or something like that. So you need to separate them by pressing the enter key. It's very important to uh, to do that. But this uh, collection editor is really helpful for you to very quickly, uh, you know, initialize your uh, list box. So the items collection, that's that ordered collection that I was talking about before. It's all of the selectable items in the list box. Um, and you display it in the order that it's included in the collection unless you have the sorted boolean set to true. Um, now, this items collection is the dot items property of your list box, and then items itself has its own method. So, for example, listvar.items.add, and then you put a string value in there, will take the list, uh, the list box variable get the actual list box that it's referring to, get the items property of that list box, find the collection that that's referring to, then invoke the add method of that collection, and then pass in some string that you're trying to add at the end of your list. So if I wanted to add a new state to here, for example, I could say, um, List states dot items dot add and pass in the string ca uh, ca for California, and then that would stick ca at the very end of this. You also have the um, dot count uh, property, which gives the integer number of items in the list. In the previous example, it was four. If I added 
a value to the end of the list, it would become five. So dot add and dot count are really helpful when you're working with the uh, items collection inside of the list variable. Oh, and of course, uh, dot clear actually removes all of the items from the list. So it empties out that items collection and uh, the list box is just completely empty. All right, so another cool thing is the forms load event. Now, this is actually an event that the form gives out when you start the application for the first time, which means you can run code once as an application is starting. You don't need to wait for any buttons to be clicked or any controls to be interacted with or anything. This is what gets run as you start the application and then it never runs again. It only runs when the application is loading. Uh, and then what you would do is, um, you know, of course you're naming your forms form main like this, right? So you would have the form main underscore load procedure, which handles the uh, load event of form main. So form main dot load like that. And then inside of that, you can do anything that needs to be done as the application is starting, like initialize uh, anything in your list box, for example. What you can do is you can use this to select the default list box item. So you can say uh, list var dot selected index equals zero. And that actually pre-selects some value in your list box rather than having none of the values selected. You can actually choose one of the values to be pre-selected. Let's say if you want to give a set of default values for a calculation in case the user hits the calculate button too early or something like that. So it's a really nice thing that you can do with this uh, load event. All right, so moving on, we have the financial class, which is a class that just contains a whole bunch of helpful methods that let you make financial calculations. All of these methods return the results as a double. So not a decimal, not an integer. They're, they all return doubles here. And this table just has all of the um, methods that are actually listed in the textbook. These are pretty commonly used methods uh, in this financial class. So if you notice that you know, you need to do a particular financial problem and you can come and try to figure out like, okay, what um, problem, what uh, method do I need to use based on the description of these different methods, right? You have all of these different methods that you would invoke by saying, you know, financial dot and then the name of the method. Now, all of these names are abbreviations. They are not very descriptive at all. I would not recommend naming your methods like this. Uh, because it makes it really hard to figure out what each method is doing just from looking at it. You actually have to search through and find the purpose or, God forbid, even look in the Visual Studio, um, you know, the docs. So better to name your, you know, if you ever are making procedures or methods or anything like that, better to make them understandable, you know, make sure people know what they are doing. All right, and then we have some control characters. Uh, we actually saw New Line show up quite a few times where New Line actually uh, makes your whatever string you're working on go to the next level, right? But uh, another helpful control character is tab, which inserts a, uh, a tab character into your string. If you, uh, you know, you concatenate your string with control characters dot tab and then another string that you make. And this is actually really nice because it lets you um, line up text in columns super easily. In fact, there are some really nice examples in the textbook of using tab and new line in order to make columns of information. So this uh, application actually has a really good example of using tab characters like this. Um, there's a tab after the colon right here to give some space between the um, years and the actual dollar amount. And then of course there's a new line after the end of the dollar amount in order to move the uh, string to the next line, kind of like what we have seen before. So tab to like really space things out and line things up and new line to um, 
move all of the characters onto the next uh, line. All of these are contained within one string, which is this particular label's, um, you know, text property or something like that. So in order to make all of this show up really nicely in one string, you have to use tab and you have to use uh, the new line control characters. So one last reminder, control chars dot tab is a string that contains the, tra the tab character. You can um, concatenate it to any of your other strings, either on the left or the right side of that concatenation. Uh, and control chars dot new line is the new line character. Uh, you can concatenate that to a string and that will make anything following that new line appear like it's on the next line as if you hit the enter key. So it's very helpful. All right, and then the default button. Um, if you want your user to be able to start up the application and then, you know, maybe type stuff in, uh, select some options or whatever, and then hit enter and the button, like some button is automatically pressed when they hit enter, you can use the default button. Now it's not necessary, but it's really helpful to have. Um, if you do want to choose a default button, you would want to use the one that's most often selected by the user, like some kind of calculate button. If they're putting in a whole bunch of parameters and then they press enter, um, you would want the, uh, you would want that calculate button to be pressed when they hit enter. Uh, you would put whatever button, whatever control you want to be pressed when the user hits enter, you want to put it in the the forms accept button property. So main a form main will have an accept button property. You put that button in there and it will work. And then the cancel button property works exactly the same, but it's for the escape button. So cancel button might be a good, uh, you know, it's a property that might be well suited to hold, let's say the exit button or something like that. So that when the user hits escape, the application closes. It's completely not necessary, but it could be a good quality of life if you want to do that. All right, well, that is all the addendums that I quickly wanted to go over. Of course, please do look through the apply the concept stuff and see if, you know, any of those examples that they have make sense. Maybe even walk through those examples yourself. But, you know, that's just the top level look at all of those extra things that they wanted to include.